Head over to miniaturemarket.com where they have thousands of board games at discounted prices and you can sign up for product alerts. Hello my friends, it's the Game Boy Geek here. Today, we're gonna be out exploring. We're gonna be digging at sites, trying to find things we want. We're gonna explore new sites and having to deal with guardians that are there. We're gonna be researching and writing down our research using items and artifacts. Today, we're trying to find the Lost Ruins of Arnak. This is an interesting worker placement and deck building game from CGE. It's for one to four players. Let me show you how it's played. I'll see you on the other side. This overview is brought to you by Bezier Games' new standalone game, Whistle Mountain, which has a unique twist on worker placement, and then recently I gave it a saxophone serenade. Check it out at BeziersGames.com. Now I first want to mention that this is not a full production copy. This is a pre-production copy, so the boards aren't necessarily cardboard. They're, they're, they're a different material, and the art isn't quite as sharp on this, so uh, the materials here are not final, but the art definitely is. Now in Lost Ruins of Arnak, you're gonna be going out and digging at different sites, exploring new sites, and moving up different research tracks. There's many different ways to get points in the game. Over the course of the game, you're gonna be researching and writing things down up on this research track, and as far as you get, you'll get a certain amount of points. So the further up the track you go, the more points you'll get. And not only will you get bonuses that I'll show you later as you move up the track, but if you get all the way to the end, you'll be getting a big amount of points. Plus, once you're there, you'll be able to research even more to get more points. Those are two main ways to get points in the game. Another way is by exploring new places. Each of those is going to get you these idols that will also get you points as well, three points. And as you explore new places, you'll find guardians guarding that area. If you're able to take care of them, you'll also get points for these five each at the end of the game. You'll also be purchasing cards of items and artifacts over the course of the game, and they'll get you points on the bottom right of those at the end of the game as well. And you'll also be getting some fear cards over the course of the game. Those are minus points. Those are all the main ways to get points in the game. Building a deck, exploring, and researching. The game has played over five rounds. Each round, players are gonna be drawing five cards in their hand. Everyone has a starting deck. And from those hands of cards, you're going to select an action, and then it's gonna be the next player's turn. Now, when you draw your cards, each card has two things. They have a travel icon on the upper left, and they have sort of an ability or something in the middle. You can use it for either or, the travel or what's here. The fear cards kind of clog up your deck, but you can use them to move. For example, one thing you can do on your turn is go digging. And to do this, we essentially would put this in our play area. These are normally in your hand. We'll put this in there and we'll use that boot there. Now I can go to a spot that costs just one boot. Some of them might cost two if someone's already there. And keep in mind that some spots are blocked. Here in a three-player game, we have three of the double spots blocked. But let's say I want to go here with that one boot. I will simply get this arrowhead resource. Now, the resources are held on its own board, like compasses, gold, and scrolls, and arrowheads and such. And this is usually at the bottom of the main board, but I place it off to the side so we can see the cards a little better on the camera. So this would go off to the side in a play area. Uh, now, we did our main action, and normally it's going to be someone else's turn, but when you have cards with these lightning bolts, these are sort of free actions. You can take as many of these on your turn if you want. And again, if I didn't want to use these for travel on a future turn, I could just turn these in for resources. So I could spend these two and get two compasses or two gold. Sometimes you want to do it right away, sometimes you don't. It depends on what's going on with the rest of the game. Once I'm done with my main action, any of those free actions, it's the next player's turn, and you keep going in clockwise like this until you either don't want to play any cards or you're sort of out, so then you'll pass. Once everyone passes, that's the end of the round, so let's go over all the different options you have for your actions. Now, we already talked about digging, that's essentially spending boots to go to a space that's already there on the board with art and getting the resources that are there. Another thing you could do is explore. Now, to explore, uh, you need to be able to pay uh, you know, the travel cost and depending on the level you're going. So this needs three compasses to get this far. And in this case, if I wanted to go here, I would need a boat like that. Now, there are some cards in the game that actually give you uh, even better travel. There's some cards that you'll get that have an airplane and that can take you anywhere. Uh, also, you can always spend two coins to hire an airplane and go anywhere as well. But let's say we did that. Let's say on our turn we spent this, and we spent three compasses, and we went here. Number one, we're going to get this bonus. There's a bunch of different ones on the board. And these are going to give us things like, in this case, it's going to get us simply a scroll. 
So it's gotten us the scroll, and once you use it, you flip it over. There's going to be three points at the end of the game, but there's cool things that you can do with the idols. For a free action, notice they have these little the free action icon here. You start on the left and you can fill this up, but when you do that, you can take any of these, like drawing an extra card or getting resources or turning gold into the best resource. But when you do this, you're covering this up because at the end of the game, points are going to be these as well as these. So right now we have seven, eight, nine, there's 10 points here. But if I go here, it's covering this up, essentially taking one point away. So as you get those and you use them, it's going to be costing you two, three or four points essentially to use some of these, but sometimes it's worth it. So when you explore this, you're going to explore, in this case, a level one. So we will take it out, we'll put it up. But when one comes out, I want to show you the cool artwork there. Uh, but a guardian will come out like this. And essentially, this is telling you that uh, when you go there, again, we would have placed a worker there, uh, we have to be able to take care of this guardian. Now, before the Guardian comes, you actually get to use the effect. So you get to, in this case, draw a card and get an arrowhead. But now, um, for an action on a future turn, I can uh, do these things to get rid of the Guardian. So for example, I could basically discard a card into my play area without using it, and then these two resources. And in this case, it gives you a reward. You get to draw another card. You collect this, and this is going to give you five points for every Guardian you've you know, dealt with at the end of the game. Now, if I don't deal with this, anybody who's at one of these spots at the end of the round, when you pull your workers back, essentially will get one of those fear cards. And you remember those fear cards are bad because they're minus one point and they sort of clog up your deck. So going there could be good. You never quite know what you're going to find and you know you're always going to get a guardian and you're going to have to deal with it or get a fear card. And if you explore even further, you're going to need six compasses and more travel, but you're getting double the amount of idols. And typically the spots here are going to be better as well. They're going to give you better resources. Another thing you could do for your main action is to buy a card. Now, to the right of this staff are all items. To the left of it are artifacts. Artifacts are more powerful, but they cost more. These ones cost coins, where these cost compass. Uh, and they both work a little bit differently. Now, I brought these off the board just to give you a closer look at what they do. Now, these things are pretty cool. The artifacts, when you purchase this for four compasses, you get to immediately do this, which is essentially getting rid of a card. You can get rid of one of your fear cards out of the game, and you get an arrow ahead. Now, this will go you know, to your, your spent cards area. And this is important because at the end of the round, once you're done, you're gonna take all the cards that you've used, shuffle them up and put them at the bottom of your deck. You don't have to wait to cycle through the rest of your deck in order to get these cards. But on a future turn when this card comes up, you'll have to pay a scroll in order to use this ability. But the first time, right when you buy it, you get to use it right away without waiting for it to cycle through, which is a really cool aspect of the game. Now, item cards are cool because you'll spend gold for those. You don't get to use them right away, but they go to the bottom of your current deck, which means you're going to be getting this most likely next turn. And that's really cool, too, because it speeds up the actually abilities that you'll be able to buy. Unlike most deck builders, you have to wait for things to cycle through. These, you get them pretty much next turn most of the time, unless you've got a really big deck that you've built. Now these are cool, like the Precision Compass allows you to buy an artifact for three less compasses, so this one would only cost one. This one, if you discard a card to your play area, you get to draw a card and banish a card out of the game. Uh, really cool, the Army Knife, you can choose any two different options. So they do all sorts of different things, and all the cards in this game have great artwork and unique. They're all unique, you don't see two of any of them. Now one of the last main options you have is to research. To research, you must spend the resources so you can decide which track to go off. Now these are usually on a board below this, but I've taken that off to the side just to make it easier to see all the, the you know, this is a very large vertical board. Now, when you research, you have to have your magnifying glass either ahead or at the same spot as your book because you, you're learning things and you're writing it down. So let's say we go here. Well, this is going to give you a coin, and if it's here at the end of the game, you'll get a point. But later on, if you move this here, now this could continue to move on its own. But if you bring this up to it, now you're going to get an assistant. Now you have to take one of the three assistants and for a free action, once per round, you can exhaust them and use the ability, like using a compass or a boat, or you know, getting rid of a card out of the game, or getting a scroll, for example. And as you research more or move this up more, sometimes you'll be able to get them on a gold side, and that's essentially turning an assistant over to the other side where it actually gives you a more powerful ability. Now when you move into one of these squares, if you're the first one there, you get this bonus. It's free. You just look at it, you get it, you discard it, and you get the resource. So there's a little bit of a race aspect of trying to get to some of these things. And again, you're picking the track. Like from here, I can move here or here. 
uh, from both of these we're moving up to here and you're spending the resources if you get all the way to the top you're going to get a ton of points plus you get a reward and for the rest of the game you can research to uh, the actual lost ruins themselves to get a bunch of points and this is interesting too where if you want to get this you need to spend this this you spend this this you spend this but if you want this one you have to spend this and this because it's like over this this one you'd have to spend this or this and if you want this one you got to spend this this and this and it's a really interesting way of of, of sort of you know, spending a certain amount of resources to get a certain amount of points, but you can do that as your main action as well once you're up that high. Now, after everyone's passed, it's the end of the round, and something interesting happens is the two cards on either side of the staff get removed. Then the staff moves to the next round, but then it's gonna get filled up. And it's gonna be getting filled up with artifacts on the left and items on the right, which means as the game goes on, items are gonna be less available and artifacts are gonna be more available. And it just, it's a really interesting part of the game. And at the end of the fifth round, you're gonna cut up all your points again by the idols, any points left on your board, points from cards, uh, points, five points for guardians, and then how far you went up on each of the research tracks for your magnifying glass and your book. Whoever has the most points at the end is the winner. There's also a back side of the board, which has a different temple, has new and different travel costs, also has a different research track with a new way to get assistance. All right, there's the Lost Ruins of Arnak. Before I start my final thoughts, I want to let you know this: these final thoughts are brought to you by Gray Fox Games' Campaign Trail, which is on Kickstarter right now and was my strategy game of the year for the elegant multi-use card-driven action system. Check it out at grayfoxgames.com. So on to Arnak, the Lost Ruins of Arnak. First of all, the thing I like about this is the great art. Uh, I know you can tell it in the cards, and again, because this is a pre-production version, the tiles didn't look quite as good as they will in the final version, but when I first looked at this, it reminded me of like the computer game Myst, which was like this beautiful world back in the day, uh, and kind of like Forbidden Island-ish, uh, how just beautiful and mystique it looks, and this game's art really draws you in. This has such an interesting blend of mechanisms, where you have deck building and worker placement, but also very some other interesting things of the way cards slide down, the way you can use the idols. A lot of really interesting, and going up the research track in different orders, interesting little twists to this game. I love these. Uh, the multi-use cards, I like that you're, you know, you're, you're basically playing these cards to possibly move workers, but you're also possibly using them for the ability and you're trying to figure out which one to use. You're also having the flexibility of being able to spend coins to move anywhere you want. So, but the multi-use cards here is fun. I always like them in, this, in games and these ones work great, especially how some of them are like, you know, free actions that you can take on a turn. You can do a lot of stuff on one turn. I like that the cards are all unique. Every one that comes out is different and they're gonna do different and cool things. Uh, it's exciting to see them come out. It's like, oh, I can do this, oh, I can do that. And they're just all really cool. Uh, the item and artifact ratios, when those change as the game goes on, it just gives the game a very interesting arc where it's like at the beginning, you've got a lot of items available, but as the game goes on thematically, you know, you've had time to research and now you're finding these artifacts. And it's really cool how like you go from using coins to get items that do cool things to spending compasses to get uh, the artifacts. And, and you know, it's just a very interesting arc how that works in the game. And the artifact cards are so cool. They're so powerful. And it's such a cool idea that you can just use these things immediately and not have to pay anything extra for them. But then eventually when they come back out, you gotta pay something, you can use them again. But I love the fact that in this sort of deck building element, you can buy something and use it immediately. It really speeds up the excitement of deck building. Oh, I gotta put it in my discard pile. I've got so many cards. I'll probably see it six turns from now. No, buy it and use it now. It's one of the best parts of this game. Also, the items, where it's like you buy them, you don't use them immediately like the, art, the artifacts, but they go right to the bottom of your deck, and usually that's gonna come up on your very next turn. So another way of speeding up the reward for buying cards in a deck building game, you're not snoozing, waiting six turns to use the card, you're probably gonna use it next turn. So awesome. I typically don't even like deck building games, but the way that this one uses it, I loved it. And I, I, I think more games are gonna use this in the future because it just works so well and it's a brilliant idea. Uh, I think the game's gonna be easily expandable by adding more cards, new boards, things like that. So that's gonna be a good thing for this. Uh, I like moving up the research tracks. I like how they're sort of linked and you decide which way to go and, oh, someone went this way and got the extra token. I'll go this way and get the other token, but I gotta beat this other person. I like that you have diff different decisions like that. There's not a lot of negative things I can say about this game other than uh, it can lead to some analysis paralysis, AP, if you will, because uh, 
Sometimes someone's just gonna do what you were gonna do right before you and you've gotta rethink kind of your entire turn because there's a lot to think about, a lot to sort of plan for in your turn and you're like, okay, I'm gonna do this and then maybe next turn I'll do this, but I wanna use this card for this. And you kind of have a bunch of turns planned in your head. And when it comes to your turn, if you can't do it because let's say someone just went up on the research track, took the token that you're really gonna use and you needed that to do this and to do this, then you kind of have to sit back and think and go, Oof, I'm sorry guys, I gotta rethink my entire turn and like the two turns after this now because I had a really good plan and now I gotta wait. And sometimes that can happen to you this game and there's so much to think about where even if you're playing ahead, others' actions can change what you're gonna do and it could hinge you to some analysis paralysis. Only negative I can say there, but overall this game's fantastic. It is a breath of fresh air uh, in both worker placement and uh, resource management and deck building and card draft it's just everything it's really cool and because of that it's getting my highest honor which is a saxophone serenade so here we go Lucky Duck Games has launched a brand new online shop and are offering you my viewers a special discount during checkout, use promo code GAMEBOYGEEK10 and you'll save 10% on the price of your games. On the Lucky Ducks Game Shop, you'll find exciting new releases such as Tang Garden, which I recently reviewed and the link is below, and It's a Wonderful World, as well as award-winning games like Chronicles of Crime, which is one of my favorite cooperative games of all time, and Vikings Gone Wild. So why not visit LuckyDuckGames.com now and find something new to play.